Hello everyone, I am Isabel Zimmerman. If you're in this room, you're probably looking for a talk called Holistic MLOps for Better Science, hopefully. Um, so I work for a company called Posit. Uh, if you are familiar with a company called Our Studio, as of last week, I think, we were Our Studio, we are now Posit, uh, really embracing the extension to all the beautiful things we've done for the art ecosystem into Python. But a little bit more about me. Uh, this is me, this is my dog, Toast. Um, I am a full-time open source software engineer. I write Python packages. Hello. Um, but uh, I'm also a grad student currently. Um, so I get to, you know, spend my small amount of free time playing games like Mario Kart. Uh, if you're not quite familiar with Mario Kart, it's pretty low stress um, in theory, unless you have friends like mine. Uh, and you get to drive little go-karts around. There's a famous track called Rainbow Road. So this is me, this is Toast. We're playing Mario Kart together. But maybe more importantly for this talk, what is MLOps? MLOps is a set of practices to deploy and maintain machine learning models in production reliably and efficiently. And these practices can be hard. When I started, I was at a company where I was deploying machine learning models on Kubernetes systems, which is really like the worst of both worlds. You're trying to deploy model systems and you're working with Kubernetes. Um, and I felt really, I, I had data science skills and the tools I were, was using, they weren't quite built for people like me. Um, they were built for maybe a cloud architect. Uh, and I didn't think that I should have to have maybe all the knowledge of a cloud architect or a systems engineer to be able to at least get my models to a point where um, a DevOps team could easily deploy them. Uh, real quick, has anybody in here like deployed a model before by a show of hands? Okay. And keep your hands up if that was just a delightful experience, like best, best moment of your day. Okay. So maybe my hypothesis was correct. Uh, I ended up moving career paths to build a package called Vetiver that is built for data scientists to help you guys and me, selfishly, deploy models a little bit easier. And if I think about um, you know, who's making models, it's a lot of times people uh, writing R code and people writing Python code. So this is actually a package in both Python and R, so you can download it from CRAN or from PyPI. But when I was learning about data science, I learned about a data science life cycle that looked kind of like this. So you start by collecting data, you understand and clean the data using tools like the tidyverse or data table if you're in R, or if you're in Python, it's things like pandas, numpy, suba. From there, you're going to train and evaluate your model. Uh, once again, in R, that's, you're gonna be using tools like tidy models and caret. Uh, in Python, that's things like scikit-learn or PyTorch. And, you know, when you're learning about these things, you learn about all of the best practices for making machine learning models and all the best practices for doing your data, um, data analysis work. And these tools have done such a fantastic job of uh, having these best practices kind of baked in that you might not even think about it. So if we look at data science code, uh, it's maybe, some of this is more important than others for this talk, but this line four appears in most places uh, if you are making a model, and that's setting that random state, or you setting your seed. And this is to ensure reproducibility, uh, and it's something that we've all kind of accepted. We know this is a best practice, and it's like it's in code like we see it all the time. Uh, this is a little data set looking at predicting light counts on YouTube, um, if the ad is funny, if it shows the product, the data looks something like this. And when we get to modeling this data, before we make our model, we know that we're going to split this into a training and a test set. Uh, we're going to make sure we're not giving our model the answers to the questions before we're training it. This is built into the code. This is a best practice. We know about this. And I'll show you one more. Um, you know that you need to choose the right feature engineering for your job. So we need to like, do an ordinal encoder here um, and use our random forest regressor. Uh, you're gonna put this in a scikit-learn pipeline um, to kind of package up everything that's being fitted all at once. And we know things like this. We are data scientists. This is best practice. 
But then you get to your first job and you realize there's more to life than setting random seeds and splitting things into training and test sets. Uh, there's questions like, okay, so I trained my model. How am I going to hand it over to my teammates? Like, am I going to email them a job lib file? Hopefully not. Um, maybe you'll use GitHub. Uh, but then what about what happens when you have to put this inside of some sort of application? Are you going to copy and paste this code into your application? Again, hopefully not. Um, and what happens when you need to make sure your model is continuing to perform well a month, a year, five years from now? The, the world is broader than the scope that, you know, at least I first learned in school. And this is really important because if you develop models, you should probably operationalize them. And this means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But in general, I think um, we can kind of agree that the business value of models usually occurs when it's outside your local environment. So there's more to this cycle. And this is what Vetiver aims to help out people or help people with, um, especially learning uh, people who are learning to deploy and version and monitor a model. Okay, so that was enough data science. We're back to Mario Kart now. Um, when you log into Mario Kart or open up your little game, uh, you realize there's different game modes. If you wanna just learn the handling and drive around at a leisurely pace, you can go at 50 cc's. If you wanna up the ante, you like kinda got it figured out, you can go 100 cc's. If you know all of the game, like you're super ready for this, like blazing fast, drifting around corners, you're going 150 cc, super fun, but you enjoy it at every level. Um, and you kinda like, you can play it at every level and you get all the good Mario Kart stuff. And we're gonna think about model ops in the same way. Some things are simpler, like it's a little bit slower. It's your 50cc model ops, um, and we'll speed up as we go along. So we'll start with versioning. When people are thinking about versioning, normally it's kind of um, in the context of Git, and we actually version a lot of things very often and mostly very badly. This is possibly a familiar scenario. You um, build your model, and you have it saved somewhere, and it's named model because we're creative. Uh, and then you do some more training, you get some new data, and you have your final model. And then you have, I think you guys know where this is going, a few more iterations of what this model actually ends yeah. up being. Um, and we can see this doesn't work for one model, it doesn't scale for one model, and it lacks context between each iteration. So, oh, I'm missing it. This would be an image of a hex sticker that has a little pin on it because, um, nope, not yet. Here we go. Versioning is helpful because it helps your models live in a central location. It helps them be discoverable by your team um, because you don't wanna go like play hide and go seek with your models. Uh, and in a perfect world, it would be awesome if these could also load right into memory. So we're not trying to go somewhere, download it, job lib load, open your model, like, and then go. Like, if we could just have one line and our model is in our Jupyter notebook and, like, we're ready to rock, rock and roll, that would be, like, perfect. And this is where we look at our pins package. This is also something that was developed by our team. It's also something that's available in both R and Python, and it helps you with these demands, that our list of demands we have. So what does it look like to use pins? The core piece of pins is the idea of a model board. So we can think of this as a place for your model to be stored. It doesn't actually just have to be a model. This can be an arrow file. Um, it could be JSON. It could be a CSV. Um, and there's other data types if you're in R. And it actually can cross between languages uh, if it's a compatible type, which is also super cool. Um, but anyway, it's a place for things to be stored. And here we have a temporary board. But it could also be uh, on S3, on Azure, it would just be like board underscore GCS, uh, or our personal reposits product called Connect. <coughs> so there, there's a spot for your model to be stored. And what about the model part? So that's gonna be going into something um, called a Vetiver model. When you first train your model, there's actually a lot of information in there um, that could be leveraged later uh, to give you a more robust deployment. So you're going to put in your pipeline that you've trained earlier, and we're going to give it a name called ads. 
and that's it. You can write your vetiver pin or you can vetiver pin write your model to your model board, and it's versioned. That kind of helps out with your um, scale part. You know, it's stored somewhere else. But what about the context? If we're looking at the metadata, we can see there's a bunch of information. We can see like the like when it was created. There's a hash. We can see the file name. It's a joblib file what kind of model it is, and a few required packages or whatever else you want to put in the metadata. And I did promise that this looks the same in Python and R. So on Python, we're making our board, we're making our vetiver model, writing our model to our board. On the Python side, we are making our board, making our vetiver model, and writing our vetiver model to our board. This is super useful for teams that are bilingual in like the R Python sense. Um, so there's less you know, cognitive load when you have to context switch between languages. So that's at 50 seasons. We have our model versioned. But what if we want to up the ante just a little bit? It's super helpful later on down the road if you know what your input data should look like. Uh, this is just saving a little piece of data to better debug later when things go wrong. It allows you to have better error messages. You can kind of peek into your better model and realize like, oh, I have extra columns here or whatever. Um, like you wouldn't really make a puzzle if you don't have the image of what the puzzle looks like. That sounds like madness and very difficult to piece together later. Uh, this is the same concept. And uh, this is the exact same code we were looking at earlier. We have one extra argument, and that is p-type data or prototype data. And we're going to feed in a little bit of the X training data. It's going to be like a zero row data frame um, that's going to be translated into a pydantic base model, if you know what those are. And then your deployment later understands what uh, the data should look like when it's coming into your model, which is very useful because sometimes the real world doesn't look the same as what uh, exists in your training set. So then we have our like, beautifully versioned model. We have some p-type data saved. And then we want to think maybe a little bit more holistically about who this model is impacting. We want to make not only good models statistically, but good models ethically, um, also good documentation. Uh, model cards were created by a team at Google. Uh, it's kind of like writing down a recipe for your model, but also giving a lot of other context you will never know as much about something, um, especially in the modeling world, as when you're working on it at that moment. Uh, you can think that you're going to remember all of these like silly little intricacies that you thought would be common sense. But I promise you, um, I do this on tests as grad, grad student. I'm like, oh, that makes perfect sense. I'll never forget that. Uh, and then I realize I do. Model cards give you an explicit place to write everything down that you've been thinking about. So we've seen this vetiver pin write a few times, but what I sneakily have been hiding from you all is that this gives you a little pop-up warning um, that says model cards provide a transparent, responsible recording. Um, use the vetiver quarto template as a place to start. And of course, like anyone else, uh, when you get any information, you just copy and paste the code and you run it. And this will give you a quarto document. Quarto is a open source framework for technical publishing. Uh, my slides are written in Quarto. If you were at a talk yesterday by Daniel Chen, he also, <laughs> hello Daniel, um, he also gave a talk about Quarto. Uh, it is the coolest thing ever. I could go on a whole tangent about like how much I love this. Um, so this creates a template. There's a little bit of uh, like parameters at the top where you can write in your pin information. Um, and then it'll generate a document that looks something like this. And anything we can automate for you is automated. So things like it's a scikit-learn pipeline. It's using four features. Um, if you have a version, it'll say like version X was created at this time. Uh, and you can add some information about you and your team. And if you scroll down, you'll be able to see a printout of your p-type. Um, you know, it's a looking at different houses, like the type square foot, bed bath, uh, and some quantitative analysis about how your model is performing. This is all actually just code, even though it looks as beautiful as it does. Um, so you can add any custom plots you want um, or any custom information. 
And if you scroll all the way down at the bottom, this is where it gets kind of interesting, especially for me when I want to think about model fairness um, and how my model is affecting people. And you might think uh, like, oh, my model does not have any ethical challenges. It's predicting YouTube likes. Like that's, okay, I'm not going to write anything down here. Um, and for that, I would say there's kind of two things to think about. One, maybe think about asking the people your model is affecting. Uh, maybe they don't have the same answer as you do from the developer side. And two, even if you have, um, you've done your due diligence and you've asked everyone you should, I would just kind of leave this blank, like don't delete it, because uh, any incomplete information is better than none at all. Uh, my dad has a good quote that I think I like to give to everybody else when they're thinking about model cards. Uh, and he said, if you haven't written it down, you haven't thought it out. So even though it feels a little bit slower, um, and it's like, oh, what's this girl talking about for like five minutes about writing documentation? This is important stuff too. Um, so I think this is really important when you're thinking about holistic, what's getting deployed, um, what are the impacts to people? All right, we have our little heart for kids. We have versioned our model, and now it's time to think about moving our model out into the real world. Real world. And um, what is deployment? People have defined this in many different ways, but the way I think about this is anytime it's not on your laptop, it is deployed. Uh, in Vetiver, we think of this, uh, or we mostly do deployments as API endpoints. It's useful because you can still communicate to your model almost as if it was in memory. Vetiver has some helper functions that you can just do like vetiver.predict, give the endpoint, give your data, and it'll do the like JSON to um, endpoint, back to JSON, back to data frame handoff for you. So it feels like your model is right there. It's also useful and will make all your software engineering friends very happy because APIs are testable, uh, so it's quite robust. So our model should go anywhere outside of our laptop. You can also test these locally to make sure they're working um, as you expect them to. And that's by just creating a Vetiver API. You put your Vetiver model V inside of it and my API.run will get you a local instance. Of course, we don't want a local instance. That's the whole point of deployment. Um, so if we're trying to move this somewhere else, there is a one-liner if you're moving it to our uh, system connect and you give it the connect server, uh, give it the model board, the name, and the version. If you have a version, if you don't want to give a version, it'll just find the latest one, maybe less recommended. You probably want a robust version in place, but I mean, you can mess around and find out. And if you're not using connect, there is other ways to move your model around. It's kind of a two-step process. One, you want to write an app.py file and Vetiver Write app will help you out with this. It'll make a super small generated script for you uh, where it's essentially creating a Vetiver model with the board, pin name, and version you're looking for. Um, and then it'll set up the API. And actually a lot of cloud services right now only need the app.py file, but other places are interested in maybe a Docker file. And Vetiver.write Docker um, we'll write that Docker file that will get you most of the way there for most deployments. It'll read in this app.py file that was generated. Um, it'll peek around for requirements.txt files. And you have these things in hand um, to either deploy yourself. Uh, if you are on AWS, I think you can upload this directly into ECR and ECS, and it kind of does some Docker magic. Um, and other places have like a bring your own Docker file mentality as well. So this is deployment, but we're going to be a little bit more sophisticated. We're going to think about um, where everything is living now. So we have to think we have our model somewhere, we have our REST API somewhere, and we have our local laptop. And in a perfect world, our Docker uh, container is as small and skinny as possible, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper. And our model that we want to iterate on, that we want to store all these different versions, is going to live somewhere else. You might think it would be like nice to save this in your Docker file, um, but that's not quite the case. It's going to get very bloated, especially because you're not versioning one model, you're probably versioning lots. So let's think about how this is going to happen. So first, when your Docker container spins up, 
it's going to use that app.py file to load the Vetiver model, start up the API. Um, this is one of those holistic, like, best practices that Vetiver kind of bakes in for you. If you use those two lines from before, most of this is already happening, um, unless you're trying really hard to like do some local pins model inside the Docker container. Like you, you'd have to try to make sure that this is a very large container. So the Docker container is going to peek in to your model. It's going to load it up. And then you can communicate to this Docker container just like any other API. Uh, you can post to it. You can interact with it. And it feels great. But then, you know, you might have to do some analysis on your model. You might do some monitoring. You might have some weird instance or just any other ad hoc information that you need to get from your model. And now you don't have to peek into that Docker container anymore. You can just load it right from your um, pins board, um, right into memory, and use it as, as expected. You can do all your analysis on your model. And that kind of completes our cycle here. Um, we have our model is versioned with pins, it's deployed, it's either running in connect um, with a one-liner or you've made a Docker file, to bring it to some other public cloud. And now it's time to monitor. Because once a model is deployed, a data scientist work is not done. Um, I do have to say here that monitoring in this sense is going to be a little bit different than maybe you're used to. We're not particularly interested in, in this package, um, at looking at like CPU usage or runtime, here we're looking at statistical methods. Um, so like RSME, MAE, like, all, like is your model performing as well as you uh, thought it was or um, expect it to? And Vetiver has some helper functions to help you compute, pin, and plot metrics. I'm not going to give you like too in-depth of these, um, but just know they exist. They help you do things like store your metrics data, um, and it handles that awkward, like, I have a few days that overlap. Uh, you can choose if it overwrites um, on the last uh, export or not. And a one-liner that helps you plot the metrics using Plotly to get all that lovely interactivity. And I think this is super important to say explicitly, but you should probably be monitoring your model if it's deployed. And that's because, you know, Data science is, uh, it's a little funky. If things go wrong, you don't necessarily get an error message. Um, you don't get that big X, like cannot compile, things are failing. Like your model can continue to give you um, answers even if it's 0% accuracy. Like even if it is the worst model in existence, it will confidently give you that answer. And if you're not monitoring, you might think that answer is right. So it's super important because if you're not monitoring your model, you are oblivious to decay. And that completes our cycle. We can version deploy and monitor models. Um, we're ready for that uh, school to industry uh, shift. It's scary, it's doable, um, but there's a lot of MLOps tools out there. It's a happening space. And if you Google, what does the MLOps landscape look like? Uh, you get an image that looks something like this, and it's terrifying. Um, so what what was I thinking about when I was building Vetiver? Like, why is Vetiver different? That's kind of a loaded question. Um, but what was I thinking about when building it? And the first thing I was thinking about when I was building it is composability. So this is important because I wanted just a few simple tools that you're able to compose within themselves to make complex objects. I really only showed you guys two things today. It's the Vetiver model and the Vetiver API. Um, the Vetiver model is you know, taking your trained model and the Vetiver API is making the API. But if you wanted to make an API with many endpoints, that's possible. If you wanted to do all of the crazy, um, oh my gosh, people do the wildest API gymnastics. Um, this is built off of fast API. So any way you want to extend it um, that's compatible with Fast API is possible still. So it's composable with itself, and it can also leverage the entire ecosystem that's around these tools. Um, and not only is it composable within itself, but it's uh, like composable with maybe Dask if you wanted to, you know, train with Dask. Because this is ending just after your model is trained. 
Uh, it's supposed to feel kind of like just an extension of the workflow you already have. Which brings us to our next point. I wanted to make a project that feels good to use and works with the tools that you like. Um, I wanted something that helps kind of lower the barrier to entry to learning how to do these things um, that come after training a model. But I still wanted people to be able to use the tools that they liked, uh, which is why it's happening after the model is trained, not trying to come earlier in the workflow. Also, uh, this has happened before. This might be kind of sacrilegious to say at a Pi Data conference, but some things are easier in R than Python. Um, <laughs> so, Pins gives us a great crossroads to leverage like the best of both worlds, uh, the best of both worlds. I've had times where somebody else on my team claims their data in R, they can pin it to a board using arrow, and I just read it in and continue doing my modeling myself. And that's just a really easy workflow that works for us um, that I'd love to share with all of you if you also deal with R people. Um, if you have questions, uh, I'd love to answer them. I'm at the posit booth. Uh, right across the hall from here, or I can take questions now. Uh, I saw it. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, this sounds really awesome, actually. So, we just had a few doubts on the deployment model. So, when you say you deploy it, uh, I assume that you want to have a Docker container. And it's uh, running RKS. So do you deploy it to EKS, ECS, or some EC2? Like, where do you exactly deploy it? And how do you like log that and to get like cloud much logs? Like, you know, the server can go down. I think. Yeah. So the question is, um, where are you bringing this model? Where are you bringing the Docker container really? Um, and you can bring it to like ECS, ECR. Uh, I'm also looking at we're looking at like Lambda as well. Anywhere that bring has a like bring your own Docker container mentality, uh, which most public clouds do, um, and they'll have the logs there as well. Uh, Vetiver does not do uh, logging for things like CPU metrics or anything like that. Yes. The, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, on the model, model monitoring piece, does the package have uh, a perspective or opinion on? How to create that feedback loop? So you mentioned that there's some helpers for calculating the evaluation metrics, but is there an opinionated pattern for how to how to create that feedback loop with the out of sample observations and structure? Yeah, that is an awesome question. The question was, how do we close that feedback loop of um, new data back to monitoring? As of right now, um, we do not have an opinion on that. I would love to talk to anyone who has strong opinions on this. Um, I've been looking around on different DAGs uh, to figure out how to get that easier. Um, so I guess, best answer, don't know right now. Um, there are ways to use DAGs uh, because it is so lightweight uh, to build out that framework. Um, I'm sure you could use things like Airflow. I'm saying that tentatively. Uh, if someone else wants to chat with me about this, that would be awesome. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, when you say monitor models, where does the uh, bug go? Like, uh, is it stored in some like, storage or like, how can I format it? Yeah, that would be kind of up to the user um, to depend on how you want to pin or save those different metrics. Uh, we're able to like store them in different pins, um, and then we like bring new metrics in, and then continue to like store that on that um, model board. Your library is uh, log and uh, dot, like log object, and these are like how you uh, log. So yeah, if you're making a prediction, um, it'll come back as a data frame. So wherever you're going to store that data frame, um, if you want to store it in a pin, that would be a pretty like lightweight workflow to continue to use that ecosystem. Yep. Yes. Um, are there any uh, tools that are monitoring for monitoring uh, feature drift? Yeah, you would leverage probably, um, there's a lot of packages out there that's out of the scope of Vetiver. Um, we're looking more at like um, the metrics themselves. I know Alibi has done amazing work. I've 
got to play around with that package a lot um, that you could plug in as, um, you could, yeah, you could plug that in um, and then store it in that metrics as well. Uh, and you could pin that along with, um, here, let me go back. Do, do, do. So at the end of compute metrics, metrics is a data frame. Um, so you could add a column uh, that Alibi or another feature drift detection could add and um, just compose on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a very basic question, but what kind of customizability could I, or what kind of metrics could I see? Are they like um, preset or could I like just yeah, you can uh, use, these are scikit-learn metrics functions. Anything that has a Y true and a Y predict column um, will be able to be used in the Vetiver compute metrics function. Yes. Um, very basic question, but like, Um, so if I understood the question correctly, how would you collaborate on a model card? Yeah, I see. So. Okay. So Quarto documents are just code. It looks, actually, we're going to peek at, where did my cursor go? Doo -doo -doo. Um, if you want to see my slides, here they are. Uh, this is what a Quarto document looks like. Um, and so it is just code. It looks kind of like a Jupyter notebook. Uh, so if you wanted to use it on Git, if you wanted to store it in some other central repository uh, for everyone to collaborate on, you could um, pass that around and uh, use it that way. That is correct. That is one of my favorite things about Quarto, um, is you don't have to deal with the JSON weirdness of a Jupyter notebook. Um, even if you don't have Quarto installed, it's still super readable, um, and it can execute code chunks. Uh, if you want to execute code chunks, you can actually embed whole applications. Um, if you saw the Shiny talk yesterday, uh, you can embed Shiny apps like in your slides if you wanted to, or in that document. Uh, with a Quarto extension called Shiny Live. Um, I think one thing that I really have loved about kind of spanning this R Python ecosystem is everything in R works together super well. Uh, you're like, oh, I can, I want this. And I also want to use this. And like, how do I put it together? Um, that I think is super exciting to see with Quarto. Like you can write Python code, you can write R code, you can have applications. And it can be a document, and then if you change one line of code, it's also slides, or it's a book, or it's a website. Um, that's my little rant on like interoperability is so cool. Um, but yes, Quarto is awesome. Check it out. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you all for joining. Um, I'll be out at the closet booth if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs>